Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I was really excited to hear about Yada Yada Law School and um, reached out so that we could do something together. So this is really exciting for me. Um, I am assuming that you are all Seinfeld fans here and that's why you signed up. So we're going to talk, we're going to get very nerdy about Seinfeld today and um, we're going to talk not only about how and why it is one of the funniest sitcoms ever made, but also why it kind of transcended that to become really, I mean, a cultural force. It's the reason that I wrote a book about it, of course. You can't just write books about any old thing and hope people show up. So this is one of those things where even though I decided to write a book about it and I you know, put the time and effort into it and I figured that it was gonna be something people wanted to read. I was really blown away once it came out by seeing the evidence of that when people would come out to events, when people would talk to me about it. Um, things like the Yada Yada Law School, you know, there are college courses taught about the show. There is a, med, or at least was one that I visited, a med school class uh, that dealt with psychiatric um, diagnoses that they would give to, um, they would use the show to, to sort of practice that. And it just, it's really incredible to see the ways that it has spread and grown and kind of infiltrated our culture, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, if you really think about it, Seinfeld kind of pulled off this incredible feat when it, um, you know, when it was running on NBC in the 90s. And I believe that these are also the reasons that it continues to be something that we talk about, watch over and over again, that Netflix, you know, decided to pay millions of dollars to get the rights to to show starting next year, which I think is very exciting. I'm hoping it catches on with even more people when that happens. Um, so uh, I wanna go back to the beginning though and talk about its origins and why it really, you may or may not realize how much it sort of defied the odds. Um, it was canceled, it was almost canceled twice. Um, but it went on to run for nine years and eventually change television comedy forever. What I think is really remarkable about it is it was regarded even in its time as kind of unassailably cool, but it was also a huge hit. Um, it averaged 38 million viewers in its last season. That's each week, just like a regular episode would be 38 million people watching. Um, it's, that is huge, and I'm going to give you some comparisons so that you can understand how huge that is. Um, the Game of Thrones finale last year, which everyone was freaking out about, everyone was watching and talking about, um, that had only 19 million viewers. So Seinfeld had twice as many watching every single week when it was on NBC in its final season, and 76 million people watched the finale. Um, that is just remarkable. That's, it's huge. They, they, the whole world, or at least I would say all of America, uh, shut down when the Seinfeld finale was happening. It, you know, they showed it in Times Square. Some other networks even just didn't show any programming. They just put up a sign that said, we're watching Seinfeld, go watch Seinfeld. Um, that's how huge it was at the time. Um, so it managed to walk this line between edgy and accessible um, that made us all feel like we were the only ones in on the joke, except that was all 38 million of us felt that way at the same time. I can't tell you how many people have told me they are the biggest Seinfeld fan in the world and they're sure of it, but so many people feel that way. And I do believe there's actually some good reasons for that. This show kind of did some magic tricks uh, that are hard to repeat, and that is why it's so special. Um, so I'm going to take you through five main ways that I think Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, who created the show together, uh, managed to pull off this TV magic trick. 
So the first one is that they had faith in promising opportunities, even when they didn't know yet where they were headed, which is mainly, you know, the opportunity to make this show. Jerry Seinfeld once said, Seinfeld is something I learned to do because I was given the opportunity. Then the show spiraled off into this whole other entity that I knew I had to serve because it had its own desire to be something. I love that because it really feels that way to me. It became its own thing. It was far out of the hands of its creators, anyone involved with it. And certainly by this point, I feel like it is absolutely its own thing in the universe. And um, in fact, that is why I called my book Seinfeldia. That was kind of my name for this universe that they created that is almost like an alternate dimension that kind of exists in, you know, and interacts with real life, but it is kind of its own entity. Um, when NBC approached him and asked him if he was interested in creating a show, he said yes. He had no idea how to make a TV show. He was a stand-up comic. This was standard. Often people were, would be asked if they wanted to make a show, if they were a stand-up comedian. Um, many of those people actually had a vision for what they wanted to do with that. He had none, but he understood that this was special and that he should just say yes. So he said yes, and then he figured out what the heck he was gonna do about it. So the answer to that ended up being, or at least the first step was that he went to his friend, Larry David. Larry was a fellow stand-up comedian, and he had written for Saturday Night Live, as well as a very similar, basically the exact same kind of show on a different network show called Fridays, um, that was short-lived, but at least he had written scripts for television. He had been on the set of a television show. So Jerry decided this was a good first step, and he was right, of course. Um, together they made Seinfeld, which actually took some time to evolve into the entity that we now know and love. Um, even if you go back and watch the first few episodes, you will see they were really still finding their footing. It was not the same show at all. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is in the pilot. Um, Jerry is actually having woman problems and George gives him advice, which we all know is definitely not the way that those characters eventually turned out. Uh, similarly, Kramer was a shut-in at the time, which is also something that, you know, they dropped eventually and feels crazy now. I feel like he's the one that's the man about town. He's the one who has other friends. Um, and there's a dog that we never see again, who was essentially a network request. They thought having a dog would make the show better somehow, which just shows you what they thought about sitcoms at that time. Um, but, you know, they had to find their way. They had to first say yes and um, get together to sort of start figuring this out in order to eventually make the show um, that we now know and love and know that is brilliant. So none of that would have happened if Seinfeld had just said no to NBC because he didn't know how to make a show. Um, so the second thing that they did was that they leaned into what I would call their superpowers. So we've got, you know, Jerry tells Larry that this sitcom opportunity has come his way. He, they're at a comedy club one night in 1988 and he mentions this to Larry. So they then go on to spend the rest of their evening and this is late at night, this is how you know, comedy shows happen late at night. And so even after that, they're, you know, it's midnight, it's 1 a.m. They spend the night wandering around New York City together, talking about this idea, trying to figure out what they might be able to do with this opportunity. Uh, one of their stops was at a Korean deli where they just kind of were pulling stuff off shelves and things and, you know, riffing about the strange products they found. If you've ever been in a New York City deli, you know that many of them, you know, have the dusty shelves full of strange things. And they were kind of just like looking at all this stuff, you know, looking at the steamer table 
and kind of just making fun of everything and wondering like who eats all this stuff, who, who comes in and wants these things. Um, just kind of, you know, pontificating in the way that we now recognize as their standard operating procedure for their comedy. Um, and at some point, Larry said, this is the kind of discussion you don't see on TV. And that makes sense. The big shows at the time were Golden Girls and Cheers, among others. Those are two of the best sitcoms ever made, but they're really classic situation comedies. You know, one, The Golden Girls is about four older women living together in Miami. And Cheers is just about a bunch of goofy characters hanging out in a bar in Boston. The humor really did come from the situations in the classic sense, you know, funny character traits interacting, weird situations coming up, that sort of thing. So Larry was right. There was no, there was nothing like him and Jerry on television at that time. And that is how the idea for the show of two, in this case, very funny guys talking about everyday stuff became the starting point for what would become known as the show about nothing. Um, they made it funnier later when they talked about, um, when they had their own pitch, when they reenacted their own origin story on the television show itself, if you remember, and we see on a show that is very similar to the show that we're watching, they pitched their idea as the show about nothing. And that, you know, that idea stuck so much that it's in the subtitle of my book. It is what people usually refer to it as. Um, they were sorry later that they had given themselves that um, catchphrase to describe their own show. They felt like later they were like, it's not really about nothing. But in some ways it is. It starts out as this idea of just two guys are going to be talking about life and that's kind of it. So I do like to point out that not everyone could pull this off. Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld could because when they talk, it is very funny. So um, that is how the initial idea for the show and the pitch for the show starts. Not everybody could pull this off but they could, and um, that is how they were really sort of leaning into their superpowers. They had these powers of observation, this observational comedy, and they both had these skewed takes on the world that worked really, really well together. And that's kind of how we get Jerry and George on the show. George is, I'm sure you can guess, a stand-in for Larry David, and, um, from there, we're sort of off to the races, and they hone what they're doing as they go. And it's important that they ended up having this time to kind of find their footing. If you look at the very early episodes, not just the pilot, but the first, I would say, at least five, if not a little bit more, um, you know, you can see that they're still trying to find their way. And the way that they were able to do this on television is that they found a champion of their show. Just one, they only needed one. Uh, they found a real champion of their show at NBC because they, they probably would, well, they definitely wouldn't have survived without this. So after all of this kind of, you know, after them kind of figuring out what they were gonna do as their basic idea for the show, um, it really would, the show would have died a, an early and quick death if it were not for a guy named Rick Ludwin, who was the executive who oversaw late night and specials at NBC at the time. So Ludwin had been the one to initially recruit Jerry Seinfeld because of his standup. This was standard, um, you know, a lot of what he would do is watch their late night shows, uh, you know, things like Johnny Carson, and he would look at the comics and see who they thought deserved maybe a show or a special of his own or that sort of thing. And he would kind of just recruit people, see if they had ideas, take meetings with them and go from there. So Jerry had now, you know, created the show, urged on by Rip Ludwin. He creates the show with his friend, Larry David. 
and they shot the pilot episode. Ludwin ended up barely getting even this pilot onto the air. Um, he loved it. Some of his fellow executives even claimed to like it. Um, there was a classic uh, objection with in-house to it, which was they thought it was funny, but they thought it was too New York and too Jewish, um, which are usually, those are usually used interchangeably. If you hear executives, especially obviously back in the day saying too New York, it really meant that it was too Jewish. Um, a lot of them were Jewish. They loved it, but they were always worrying about what the Midwest was going to think. Uh, so they were worried that this would be too insidery for people in the middle of the country. Um, but Ludwin at least got the pilot on the air. No, no order to series at all. Uh, it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles at the time, and he got it on the air in 1989, um, but it was not a huge victory because it was on July 5th, 1989. So this means it's in the dead zone of summer, which especially back then, um, if we have people here who were watching network television in the 80s, you know that the summer was not when shows were on. You would have reruns on at that time. And if a show was put in the middle of summer, that meant the network was kind of dumping it. Like they didn't really expect it to go anywhere, but they didn't have anything better to put on at the time. And they did not expect a lot of people to be watching television then. And especially on July 5th, which is the day after a national holiday, they're assuming everybody's gonna be away and certainly not glued to their television sets. So it was really expected to end there. But after that aired, you know, um, with a little bit of interest from his fellow executives in-house, uh, Ludwin argued for more episodes. And his boss basically said, you know what, if you can find money in your own budget, to make more episodes of this thing, knock yourself out. So he, and this is one of my favorite little trivia facts about this show, um, he financed it by cutting one Bob Hope special. So it was like a two hour comedy special that was slated for Bob Hope who would have usually multiple comedy specials throughout the year. And um, roughly this ends up being that this one two hour Bob Hope special goes away. And now we get four half hours of Seinfeld for that. So it's a great bargain. Um, I love that Bob Hope made this great contribution to television history, whether he knows it or not. Um, they changed the name to Seinfeld at that time. And this is also when I think crucially they added Julia Louis-Dreyfus's character, Elaine, this was the one big stipulation the network had. They said, you have to add a woman to the show. And so they did. And I think we can all agree that that was a huge upgrade for everything. Um, I think at the time, the network was thinking more conventionally and thought she might be a love interest for Jerry. But um, whatever made it happen, I think, was worth it because it did get on the air. Now it had her. They were, they have a little more of a sense of what they want to do with the show now. They've had an entire year, by the way, to think about it because it doesn't air until the following summer. So we have one episode in the summer of 89, four episodes in the summer of 90, and um, it starts airing after reruns of Cheers. And that was huge at the time. This was like it. Um, in fact, NBC at the time was starting to get really worried because Cheers was getting close to having run its course and they had no idea what was going to be the next Cheers. And they definitely did not envision that Seinfeld would be. But, um, you know, they had Cheers on on Thursday nights at the time and they were really worried about this. And uh, during the summer with these four episodes of Seinfeld, they ran them after Cheers. And it actually started to, like, it showed that it was keeping Cheers' audience. Um, and that was actually a really, really important sign. Enough so that uh, the next year, 
they got 12 episodes, so three times as many. Still not a full season, which was 22 to 24 at the time. But, you know, it's, it was, certainly was better. They're making progress. And then finally, around that time, uh, others at NBC, besides Rick Ledwin, really started to see that it had potential. And as we know, it went on to be one of the defining shows of the decade. And this is around the time that they even um, do that kind of, I think, fairly self-aggrandizing arc on the show, which I love um, when they make the show within the show that is like the show. Um, and they cast it and we watch them, we watch them pitch it. That's when they pitch it, about, pitch it as the show about nothing. And that is when they, we see them cast it and we see people like Jeremy Piven and Marissa Hargitay playing people who are auditioning for the show. Um, Jeremy Piven ends up playing the George Lake character. So this is really when it starts to kind of gain steam, you know, be that thing that at least some people would go to school the next day and talk about. I think it was a still fairly young phenomenon, especially at this time. So like the young nerds really got it and saw that it was something special and it had that, um, that kind of meta feeling to it, which became one of the defining things, you know, defining kind of hallmarks of 90s entertainment. Um, so we're really starting to, to get there, you know, and catch on. And they're starting to see that um, this actually could be and will be the heir to Cheers, which was not something that they saw. But this is when they start to see that they should put it on Thursday nights and build a night around that. And that is when we get what I think a lot of us think of as the classic must-see TV lineup when it's, you know, with stuff like Friends. And they would often put the Friends and Frasier and often put kind of those other shows that, that they force on us in between them um, that we didn't really want to watch, but because TV was the way it was then, we didn't want to get up and change the channel. So we would end up watching Caroline in the City or The Single Guy or, you know, any, any number of other shows that they would sort of stick in there and hope were going to work. But um, still a great night of television and um, Friends and Seinfeld really become the two, you know, major poles of this era of sitcoms in general and obviously both at NBC on this powerhouse lineup. So, uh, so the fourth thing they did to become as legendary as they did was that they grounded almost every plot line in real life inspirations. And I feel like this is hard to believe at times because they are so crazy, but that is exactly why they did this. So the rule was they had to start with something that really happened in real life and then they could get as weird as they wanted to. Um, and this is where the writers really came in. The team of writers really came in and when they would pitch ideas to Larry David. This is what he wanted to hear and he would often ask them, did this really happen? You know, does this start with something that really happened to you? And I think that this is how, you know, the show feels at times at least like it's really reflecting our own frustrations with the minutia of everyday life. And that's where the show about nothing comes in. That's where, you know, Larry David's genius comes in. Something as simple as just trying to rent a car or losing your, um, you know, losing your car in the parking garage, um, any of those sorts of tiny little things, trying to get your Chinese restaurant to deliver to your side of the street, all of that stuff. Um, what they would do is sort of start with that little kernel of a real life idea and then blow it up to its absolute logical extreme. Like what's the worst thing that could happen if you you know, lie to your date and say that you are a marine biologist when you are not. Well, the worst thing that can happen is you can go for a walk on the beach and someone can call out for help from a marine biologist and you will be forced to either come clean about it or save the whale. Um, you know, so that's kind of how this would work. And that's why I think the show is so funny. I think it's why it feels relatable at times because it, it really reflects our frustrations and the ways we feel just trying to get through life. Um, George's neuroses 
a lot of them came from Larry David himself, especially in the early days. George was really just reenacting stuff from Larry David's life. Um, the time that George quit his job dramatically and then reappeared at the office the next Monday, acting as if nothing had happened, was something that really happened to Larry David. He did this at Saturday Night Live when he worked there. Elaine and Jerry's romance, um, or I should say uh, romance turned friendship, um, that was based in real life as well from uh, Larry David's similar relationship with a woman named Monica Yates, who, stay with me, was the daughter of novelist Richard Yates, who wrote Revolutionary Road. And if you remember the episode, it's fairly early, it's one of my favorites, called The Jacket, um, where we meet Elaine's father. He is very cantankerous and hyper-masculine and is kind of like showing up George and Jerry for, um, you know, not ordering hard alcohol when they go out and Jerry for having the jacket with the lining that's pink and white stripes on the inside. Uh, that guy is based on Richard Gates and a, an actual meeting that Larry David had with him where he was very scared of him. Um, so there's, there's lots of good stories there. Um, the character of Kramer, of course, um, I think maybe the most famously began with a guy named Kenny Kramer. Uh, he lived across the hall from Larry David at the time that Larry was writing the pilot when he lived in, Manha in Midtown Manhattan. Um, and uh, Kenny Kramer, part of the reason I think most, a lot of us at least know about this, that he is based on a real person, is that Kenny Kramer is exactly is, is the, exactly the kind of guy that you think if you know Cosmo Kramer from the show. He is an operator, um, which I mean uh, as a great compliment. And he made it very known to people, especially in New York City, that he was the basis for Cosmo Kramer. He actually, I wouldn't say this minute, probably not, but he's, he has continued to run a bus tour of sites from the show in New York City that is quite delightful and I really recommend it. He is just so much fun to listen to and watch that he just makes anything fun. But you, you know, go around town and visit places like um, the stand that the Soup Nazi is based on. You go uptown and see the um, diner that is, you know, the diner where they all hang out. That's the exterior. Uh, many fun stops in between. He tells a lot of stories and it's really, really great. And if you also remember from the show, there was a point at which um, it's very complicated, but essentially uh, Kramer on the show ends up doing what he calls the Kramer reality tour. And that is based very heavily on Kenny Kramer doing this, the real Kramer tour. The, the writers found out that he was doing this and they just thought, well, this has to go in the show. Um, they got the brochure. He's actually waving around a copy of the real brochure uh, when he's explaining it to the guys that he's going to do this this tour. And um, it's it's really funny. It is a the, in real life. It is a better tour than the one that we see. This is the one where he has kind of a broken down school bus and um, eventually ends up having to go to the local dump to dump Elaine's um, muffin stumps. It's like I said, the show gets more complicated as it goes on, but you always sound like a crazy person if you were explaining the plot of a Seinfeld episode if the person who is listening to you has never seen the show. Uh, but yeah, so it's, um, so everything, even stuff like that, which seems absolutely bananas, actually does start in real life. So there are a few exceptions to that, but most of them started that way. And the idea here was just the it would give even the craziest plot lines this grounded feeling that they could possibly happen, no matter how crazy the twists and turns eventually became. Uh, another of my favorite examples of this is um, Festivus. It is completely real. And, um, you know, this is another one where one of the writers, his dad made up a holiday, he called it Festivus. And, um, 
as soon as the other writers heard about this, they were like, well, this definitely has to go in the show. And what's amazing about this to me too, is that, um, you know, they put it in the show, we all remember it. And then it really kind of does become an even more real holiday because it goes out into the world and people love it and embrace it. And I swear that Festivus is getting more and more popular every year from what I can tell, because I do, you know, hear about this stuff as a person who wrote a book about it. And often we get like a little Festivus bump for the book sales. Um, it will often be part of, you know, store displays. You can buy Festivus polls now. Um, you know, you can buy all the stuff and people get really into uh, celebrating Festivus. So it is, one, it is one of these crazy moments of really like, what is it? Uh, art imitating life and then life imitating the art back and making this thing even bigger. So um, there are many examples of this throughout the series, whether it's Jay Peterman, the catalog, catalog magnate, uh, who is an adventurer and um, a special character in and of himself that is based on a real guy with a real catalog line that really does at least have catalog copy that sounds like the way that character talks and Festivus is real and Kramer's real and the soup Nazi is real. So um, even the craziest characters on the show have these bases in reality. Uh, so the final and I think most important key to their longevity with the show was that they created extremely distinctive moments, um, not just these, you know, characters, but moments, images, catchphrases, all of this stuff. And that is really, these are the reasons why um, we're still here talking about the show. It's why you can have the Yada Yada Law School called the Yada Yada Law School, incidentally. Um, and one of my favorite illustrations of this that I encountered was the Brooklyn Cyclones minor league team started having Seinfeld nights several years ago. And um, they are a complete scene. I was just over there recently in the same area and I was feeling sad that they wouldn't be able to do this this year. But um, they've had them consistently since because it was such a hit. I went to the very first one and it was amazing. Uh, there were Vandalay Industries t-shirts. Somebody gave me a Vandalay Industries um, business card that they had made for themselves. Lots of puffy shirts, like the one that Jerry wore once. There was a toilet paper shortage in the women's bathroom, which I do not believe was actually a planned activity. But, um, you know, everybody started, of course, asking each other if they could spare a square. You know, they, everybody kind of had their own, you know, everybody knew what to say in these moments to each other because we were all Seinfeld fans. And most spectacularly, women came dressed head to toe as Elaine, big hair, flowy dresses, you know, clogs, the whole thing. And they came in costume because there was a dance off during the seventh inning stretch doing the Elaine dance that we all know and love from the show. Um, and it was just quite, it was, it was quite a spectacular display all around. Um, there was a special guest who brought food and that was the soup Nazi. They had a junior mint toss, a marble rye fishing contest. Um, the real Kramer was there. It was, it was just, it was all there. All of the Seinfeld um, things you could possibly want. It was Seinfeld and nothing else. And people even, it, the, the team was terrible. They were losing something like 16 to two, which is very, very bad in baseball. Um, but everybody stayed because they wanted to stay for all of these activities and the team was smart enough to sort of space them throughout. And I think this is a great, just one example of many of why the Seinfeld fandom remains so strong. Um, Seinfeld fans speak their own language. So, you know, no soup for you, real and spectacular, master of my domain. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And even yada, 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 of course. Um, it all looks really simple in retrospect. You can, it's easy to just let the show kind of pass over you. We've all watched three runs a million times. 
people tell me often that they can't go to sleep without watching a random Seinfeld rerun. Um, but it really was quite spectacular, all of these different elements and the ways that they came together to make this show. Uh, many have tried to emulate Seinfeld since. Um, none have really duplicated the success that Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld found by just, you know, following their creative instincts and taking their chances when they had them. Um, the only one who's come close is Larry David himself with Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is really just a continuation of this brilliance. So um, with that, I am going to end my presentation, but I would love to take some questions and we're also going to do the raffle. So if you have questions, please put them in the little Q&A. If you don't know, it's at the bottom of your screen. There's a little bubbles that um, say Q&A. So if you have questions, I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So I would love to hear them. Great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I, uh... Obviously, I've seen all the episodes many times, and I've read your book once, and I listened to your book another time, and I still feel like I learned a lot just now. So um, thanks so much for that. Oh, good. Um, got some great questions in the Q&A, um, and uh, just as, as Jennifer mentioned, if folks have additional questions, feel free to drop them in there. Um, so our first question, um, was Larry David well-respected in comedy circles uh, when the show started? This, the stories about him reveal a kind of awkward, bizarre person. And the person asking the question clarifies that he is a big fan. Um, but uh, it's a, maybe a little surprising that Jerry would have chosen him. Were they good friends? Were, did, did he have a, a high reputation back in the day? He had a weird reputation from what I know. Um, and I think that I even remember, I think Kenny Kramer uh, told me at least some of this, but because um, Kenny was, it's, he's sort of a, you know, he is, he doesn't really like to commit to titles and jobs, but like he was kind of a comic and that's sort of how he knew them besides living near, near Larry. Um, so he had seen them out and about as well, but you know, uh, Larry was, I, I believe, I know I'm stealing this from someone who told me this once that they said he was known as a comics comic, um, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, it, like he was very out there. It was like, I would say more like an acquired taste. Um, either you liked him or you didn't. It's very fun to, if you can, I know that I've found some online um, footage of him from his earlier days doing some comedy. Some of it, you can find some things where really he's doing bits that you see turned into Seinfelds later. Um, probably maybe they're better as Seinfelds. The one that I remember is he does a bit about I, I think it really is his mother saying something about treating his body like an amusement park, which is a line he gives to George later um, during the episode, The Contest, uh, where he is caught by his mother with Glamour Magazine in a, in a compromising position alone. And, um, you know, so I think it, tur it might turn out to be just a wonderful twist of fate that this happened because I think we can all see that he was a genius at making, I don't want to call it a sitcom because I think he changed the form, but you know, at making a television comedy and doing something completely new with it. So it, it's, he might be the rare person who turns out to be much better at TV scripts rather than, you know, I don't know if that's rare, but um, it, it does turn out that he is, um, his ideas are best explained in a half hour comedy script rather than, you know, one liners on stage. Great, yeah, we've, we've got a number of additional Larry David questions. Um, so just to synthesize a few of them. Uh, first, how come he didn't play himself in the show? And then also, um, you know, he dropped off as a writer towards the end. And a lot of people think some of the later seasons were actually excellent, notwithstanding the fact that he wasn't present. I'm sure that different people have different opinions, but uh, do you care to comment on either of those? Yeah, um, wait, what was the first one again? How come he didn't, I mean, obviously oh, right. George's uh, character is modeled on him, but right. how come he didn't uh, play himself? Right, um, my understanding is that he really just didn't want to at the time. Um, a lot of time elapsed between the beginning of Seinfeld and the beginning of Curb, right? So um, at the time, um, my understanding is he felt like it was enough to be trying to run the show. And he really did 
run the show. Like, obviously, Jerry's a huge force. He was helping to write the scripts. He was helping to revise and come up with stories. But he really, because he was also on the air, like, Larry was the guy running the thing. And he was constantly complaining, even in those first early tiny seasons, right? He had the one episode, then four episodes, then 12. And he was constantly saying, I can't, I, you can, and you can imagine too, I won't do an impression because I'm not good at them. But, you know, he kept saying like, I can't come up with any more. There's this is too much. I can't do this. And he was really doing it a lot almost by himself. Um, not completely. He had a guy named Larry Charles working with him. Um, it is as they start to get going, they figure out that they can really hire a writing staff and at least get stories from them. Um, but, you know, Larry really felt overwhelmed, especially at the beginning with just the concept of like trying to figure out the show and write it and put every single thing that had ever happened to him into one of these scripts. So um, he just did not want to play himself at the time. And one thing I will say is I think as much as I love Larry and we have the gift of him later on screen, um, we also get the gift of Jason Alexander because of it. And I just think he's so, so brilliant in this role. Um, he's so good that it's hard to remember how good he's being, but he really just is a fantastic actor. And I think surrounding Jerry, who was not an actor with somebody like Jason, who was super experienced, had been on Broadway, had done lots of work. And then Julia, who's also, you know, both she and Jason can do comedy and I would say, you know, drama to some extent. And I think that informs their comedy here. And then just this brilliant physical comedian, Michael Richards. Um, so I went off on a tangent there, but I did want to say how brilliant this cast is. And this way we ended up with both. We got that and then we got Larry as himself later. And then, um, Remind me of the second question again. Um, uh, what later oh, the, how yeah. He, yeah, the changing, changing the, right. Yeah. The um, yeah, so he did leave in the final two seasons. And um, I will also just throw in there that um, people always have questions about that. And from everything I heard, there was no, this was not like any kind of animosity. He really, it's in a very Larry David move, um, was tired kind of speaking to what we were just saying. Um, he, he felt like he was sort of creatively tapped out, wanted to do other things, and Jerry wanted to go out with the show. And so they decided, okay, great, Larry's gonna go. And I think the evidence of this is that he did come back to write the finale. Um, so, you know, and they clearly remain close. So that was fine. And yes, I, the last two seasons, there is a difference, I think, is what I would say, is there's, you can feel the difference. And some people like that, some people didn't. I still think we get a lot of good, we, there's a ton of like classics left, you know, the Soup Nazis in the last two seasons, and so are a variety of other great episodes, the Merv Griffin Show, tons of them. Um, Festivus, I think, is in the back final two. Um, Bizarro's, it starts to get more, I think there's things you can see there. It gets more self-referential. It gets wackier. You get stuff like a Frogger. Um, you get a lot more Kramer, uh, which is not a bad thing per se, but um, something that I think is really telling that I didn't realize until I was writing the book is that Larry's last episode that he wrote before he left is the episode in which um, Susan, George's fiance, dies from licking poisonous wedding invitation envelopes. That is very dark. Um, and I think it's particularly funny to write that as your last episode and then walk out and be like, it's up to you guys to figure out what to do now after I killed a character and made your main characters be like, they're all just like, eh, she's dead, oh well. Um, yeah, so he was on a much darker sort of trajectory and then when he comes back and writes the finale he writes the finale that everyone hates um where they all go to prison so in in the interim two years we get a lot more sort of like goofy bright um light lighter kind of stuff and they had a much younger writing staff There's a lot of the guys and one woman um who were working there at the time had almost like not exactly just come from harvard but were a couple years out um, they were young. They had they had watched the show and been fans first. So, 
you just get this different vibe and um you know i i enjoyed reading the newspaper coverage at the time which was pretty intense and they were some of the new york papers were doing polls every week is it better is it worse is it this is it that um so they were under a lot of scrutiny as well um but they did find out that larry had been doing an awful lot of work because by the end of those two years even that group of like 10 people uh, felt like they were completely exhausted from doing the job of basically Larry David had been doing for the past several years before that. Okay, um, th we got a couple of casting questions. So one of them was um, about Jerry's father. So he was replaced and um, I don't think he was the only one, if I'm not mistaken, from the first season. I think there were a couple of people that disappeared and they were replaced with others. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, both fathers, both George's and Jerry's fathers had this happen to them. And um, that was one of those things like, I mean, I don't think it's totally uncommon with shows like this, especially from this time. Um, it became more popular than they expected. And no offense to those other actors, but I think when they became more popular and also you know, figured out that they were going to use the parents a lot, which I think is great because those, but I think both sets of parents are phenomenal. I mean, George's really steal the show, but Jerry's are great too. And both fathers, um, I believe it's like the, might not be the first, but it's like the second or third. It's right in the beginning that we see Jerry's father and then he is recast. And what I do love is when they cast Jerry Stiller as George's father, um, they were actually able to reshoot the scenes from the one episode that the other father had been in. They reshot them with Jerry Stiller. And so if you watch the reruns, you'll get Jerry Stiller in that role. They were not able to do it with, um, with Jerry's father because it was so close to the beginning that Jerry looked noticeably younger and also even his apartment was different they changed the set a little bit so they weren't it would have been very very strange and obvious that they had reshot that but they figured out as they went on that like this was really going to be big in reruns and so they actually fixed they actually swapped jerry stiller in uh for the old dad so his poor old dad is just gone forever um and hard to find at this point okay and um we got a great question here about diversity and this is something that um i think the show is is not infrequently criticized for these days is the you know it's the lack of, of diversity on the show can you so the question is um was that ever discussed during production to your knowledge i would add to that um you know what was that atypical for the time were there shows that were more that had a more diverse cast that were of a similar um kind of profile to seinfeld it was a different time for sure and i don't want to you know i don't want to excuse that or anything else um but this was, I don't, I mean, I can't actually, I've been doing a little work in this, so I don't want to make a definitive statement, especially among a bunch of lawyers. Um, but it's close to the peak of what segregated television, like you would have black shows and you would have white shows. Um, and often if you looked at the ratings, even you would see that, you know, African American audiences were watching completely different shows from white um, audiences. Um, a lot of people were watching Seinfeld and it would have been great if it were diverse. And I think specifically because we were at least a little aware by that time that we should be doing this. And also it's New York. So this show and Friends both um, were rightly criticized for um, showing, you know, showing New York and it's like, how could this possibly be true? Um, I don't think it was discussed really in a serious way behind the scenes. Um, they generally tend to have this attitude of like, you know, that's just like, they just were really interested in comedy. I mean, Jerry said it before, like, that's his main focus. All he wants is to be funny and he doesn't want to like think about all this other stuff. Um, David Allen Greer read for the role of George. Um, he just didn't get it, which is, you know, it's just interesting to think about it. So I think it would have been a completely different character, but um, that could have been great. Uh, they did, I would say marginally better than say a friends with their background, not even background, well, background too, but um, 
like secondary characters, the, the characters that these, that our four would encounter around town, you know, um, they did do a little bit better with showing us in New York in general that was more diverse, but, um, you know, and sometimes it's, there's also times when maybe we wish they hadn't because it's not quite the way we would do it now. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a weird time and it was right on that cusp of like, there's a couple of these, oh, let's say like Friends, Seinfeld, and then Sex in the City kind of are like, what are you doing in New York if um, you're not gonna show more than just white people? Thanks, and uh, I think we have time for one more before we move on to the raffle. Um, so another question kind of about how the show has aged. Um, how many plot lines could have been ended in five minutes had the characters only had cell phones? Many, um, <laughs> absolutely many. Uh, I always, for I, the one I always think about with this, but there's so many others, is the movie theater where they're all trying to find each other because it's just so not, we're like, what are they doing? Um, but what I would say, I mean, there's been a number of online um, kind of attempts to talk about this in a funny way. Like there was the Seinfeld, um, Seinfeld Today um, Twitter for a while where they were kind of like pitching ideas for what might be happening with the characters now. And I feel like the characters are so strong and also life hasn't gotten any less annoying with all of this stuff um, that you can easily imagine the show today having additional plot lines because, you know, because of online dating or a million different apps or even just texting and, you know, social media, all of this stuff, you can, you can plop them right into this and imagine how everything could still go wrong for them. So um, it turns out like, you know, the sort of annoyances that this is built on, it's like, we still, aren't we all still annoyed constantly by life? So, um, and I've seen even, there's a, there's a, um, quarantine episode, this happens from time to time too, people write like fake episodes of the show and put them online and, you know, put them in modern settings and there's a quarantine uh, spec script kind of floating around the internet if you'd like to look that up. That is awesome. Um, the one I always think of when I think of technology is the phone message one where George uh, concocts the excuse to go steal the answering machine tape. Yes. Uh, <laughs> exactly, answering machine tapes. Mm -hmm. um, it's great. The kids can learn about all the old technologies we used to have, you know. Um, but I guarantee you they'd have problems with like, they'd try to like share their, you know, Netflix password with each other and something crazy would go wrong and et cetera. So, um, you know, there's, they, they could always get into some trouble. Absolutely. Okay. So I think the time has arrived. So we've got in this bowl uh, the names of all the folks who met the contribution criteria. And uh, now we're going to do the raffle. Yes, um, so I will announce the names and then do you want them to send their mailing address to yada yada law school at gmail.com? Yes, that would be perfect, okay. thank you. All right, here we go. Tiny, tiny things. All right, the first one is Robert Krauss. Okay, hey, Robert Krauss, congratulations. The second one is David Cabrales. The third one is Robert Paris. The fourth one is uh, Gopal Bhagavatuka. I don't know if I got that right, sorry. Tula, sorry. Um, wait, that's four, all right. And the fifth one is Stephanie Collins. Great, well, thank you very much. All so right. if your name was just called, please email your uh, mailing address to yada yada law school at gmail.com and we will get those out to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was really fun and I'm glad we raised some money.
Yes, thanks so much for reaching out and I'm glad we could do this. By the way, how can folks find you if they want to keep up with you? Uh, JenniferKArmstrong.com and then that will bring you to all the things you may want and not want about me. You'll get all my socials and all of my books. So thank you. Sounds great. Thanks very much. All right.